Well, good morning and welcome to Brixington Community Church. If you're here in the building this morning and this is your first or second or third time, you are especially welcome uh, and it's good to see you. And if you are joining us online for the first time, then welcome to you as well, wherever you are. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so in the chat column on the screen or you'll find various ways of contacting us on our website. Now, my name is Norman, I'm one of the elders here, and Rod, who is also an elder, is going to be bringing God's word to us. Now, if you were expecting a much younger man by the name of Simon, um, he is uh, unfortunately suffering with COVID. Yesterday was day eight, and he's still testing positive. Uh, and Kay is a few days behind him, also positive. So we will pray for them later on. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, please meet with us this morning and reveal to us more of the majesty and sovereignty of God the Father. Show us more of the beauty of Jesus, his Son, and our Saviour. And will you, Spirit of God, bring to us today that which you know we need. Just take a moment to come and ask the Spirit to meet with you, to lead you. You may be rejoicing this morning. You may be thinking of challenges ahead, like an operation or an examination or issues that need resolving in your family, all kinds of things we come to this morning. Uh, we bring them through the door, but now we just want to submit ourselves and the things on our minds to the Spirit of God. Let's stand and sing.
take a moment to bow down. Rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Speak out loudly, use your tongues to adore him, to say how much you love him, to rejoice in our Saviour. You're at home, shout out and rejoice in the Lord. Please take your seats. We're going to share the Lord's Supper and uh, if anyone at home watching uh, is not prepared, well, there'll be an opportunity in a moment as we sing to go and find some bread and some suitable wine or fruit juice, whatever uh, you have the luxury of choosing. Uh, we don't. <laughs> 
Uh, but whatever it is suitable, we're going to come and enjoy this meal together. Uh, the church in Corinth was in a bit of a mess and they were abusing some of the things that they had been taught, one of which was around the issue of the Lord's Supper. So Paul writes to them very familiar words to us. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Father, as we come to share this meal together, it highlights what a sinful nature we have. It focuses on the fact that whatever righteousness we think we may have is nothing that would demand a place in your presence. But what it also emphasizes is the Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us, the whole purpose of him coming to heaven was Calvary. And we come, Father, to acknowledge our sinfulness, to once again confess that we need you, we need your forgiveness. We need repentance. Thank you, Father, for those that believe we have the joy of knowing that repentance, of knowing that forgiveness. For your body was broken for us and your blood was shed to cleanse us from all sin. And in doing so, we are now clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is in him and him alone that we come before you. Thank you, Father, that this is a meal of remembrance, but also a meal of rejoicing. And as we eat and drink together as one body in Christ, may you bless us and reveal to us more of Calvary and our salvation. Let's sing again. Let's stand to sing.
doing at the moment by way of serving is that uh, you see two tables either side and if those two blocks go first to the table followed by these two blocks um, you'll be served the bread and the wine and what I'd like you to do th this morning is when you return to your seat eat the bread on your own and just take time to be with the Lord personally and then a few minutes later we will drink the wine together okay eat the bread when you sit down hold on to the wine it was a simple meal that Jesus took and said to his disciples do this in remembrance of me this is represents this broken bread represents my broken body my defiled body my injured body my pierced body for you and although he was saying it to his disciples some 2000 years ago He's saying it to each one of us this morning. This is, Jesus says, this is me for you. So let's eat in remembrance of him. Thank you.
I said earlier that this is a meal of remembrance and of rejoicing. We drink this wine in remembrance of the fact that the blood of Christ was shed for us and without that we could not be forgiven of our sin. That blood represents our cleansing. It represents us being able to come before the Lord in person. But we drink this wine also to rejoice. Because Jesus also said, every time you eat this and drink this, it's one less time before I come again. So we're going to drink knowing that we're a bit closer to when Christ returns. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, remember, but also rejoice as you drink. We're going to sing again and after that Eric is going to uh, bring our prayers of intercession and after Eric, John is going to bring our reading. So let's stand to sing.
Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? <sighs> Psalm 104 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord God, you are the very God. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He sets the earth on its foundation, and it can never be moved. Ponder on those words. Well, Christmas is over and a new year dawns. And let's hope and pray most earnestly that it's an improvement on the last two. I do hope you all had a pleasant time with family and friends over the holiday. But let's just remember those who have had recent illnesses and bereavements or have been separated from loved ones over the holiday time and for whom Christmas has not been such a happy time. But above all, let's not forget the real reason for Christmas, that God sent his one and only son to the sinful world as a once and for all sacrifice to take away the sins of the world. And whomsoever shall believe on Jesus Christ our Saviour will inherit eternal life. What a wonderful promise. And as we've just taken communion this morning, let's give thanks again and remember that Jesus suffered and died for us on the cross. I'm sorry, but I must mention COVID again and its variants this morning. Dear Lord, as conflicting advice continues during the rise in infections, please, please bring a blessing of common sense to the nation that folk will continue to ensure they are fully inoculated and adhere to any regulations such as lateral flow tests and other testing. And a special prayer for the NHS and the staff who are stretched to breaking point. Please bless them, Lord. Please, Lord, let there be an easing of this pandemic and that some of the easing of travel restrictions won't have an adverse effect. And we think particularly this morning of Simon and Cain Okay, and any others who have been infected with COVID and for a speedy recovery. And as the colder months are upon us, I pray for those in the community who are struggling with the ever-increasing costs of heating and food. I give thanks for our own food bank and the many others set up throughout the nation. Please bless all involved and pray that donations will continue in abundance. On wider issues, we pray for relief to reach places like Africa and the Yemen, struggling with poverty, starvation, and the effects of continuing conflict. We remember the Christians often working in hostile environments, and for those who are persecuted for their beliefs. I pray your protection, and that your word, most importantly, is heard. For this country, I pray for wisdom and guidance for the governments, but in these difficult times, and for all those in local government. And finally, I pray for our own community in Exmouth, for the ministry of our church, and that we will be kept safe, and most of all, that your word will continue to flow from Brixington Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good morning. <clears throat> the reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 11, beginning at verse 19. Now those who had been scattered in the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was upon them and was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. 
And when he arrived and saw what the, the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all the more to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him into, to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. Right. Rod's the only elder I know who has a personal assistant. So. <laughs> Let's pray for you, brother. Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, I pray for Rod that you will take him out of himself and into you, that you will bless him. Would you give him the words that you want us to hear? And as he speaks, enrich his soul, we pray. Amen. I've had a defect in myself. I think the Lord missed out a couple of ears because I don't have enough ears for a microphone, a mask and a pair of glasses. So I've been having to sort of work between the three of them. So hard, isn't it, to, uh, to do the right thing in the right time, in the right place. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and uh, so pleased to, to see you all. It's uh, one of those things that I, uh, I miss about uh, church, is getting here freely, shall we say. You know, you have to think about it, you have to plan about it uh, these days, because we're so far away at the moment, but... It's one of those things that uh, concentrates the mind a little bit. And uh, I just hope that as we share what God's given me this morning, uh, that it will unite us in a different way, in, in a deeper spiritual way, if you like. Um, I, I joked with uh, Norman a few weeks back now, because he asked a very important question. What happens if somebody who's supposed to be preaching suddenly goes down with COVID. And I said, it's all right. Every, every minister has a, something in his back pocket. Uh, we didn't realize it was going to sort of be so quiet so, so soon. I think God's just testing my, uh, my ability to be, be confident in these things. But, uh, so we had to put our heads together and uh, and pray an awful lot and and it was good actually it was a good time to uh, to be focused anyway because sometimes at uh, this time of the year churches uh, hold commitment services to enable the congregation to recommit themselves to god's service for another year it's a sort of ritual in some churches we don't do it here but in churches that i've led we've often used the Baptist Union's guidelines to give us a structure. Um, in doing that, we promise to be people, with certain promises, we promise to be a people who are a gospel people, a worshipping community, a missionary people, a sacrificial community, and an inclusive community. Now, that might not be too much of a surprise because they are, in fact, the five tenets of the, of the Baptist Union. They seem to me to be a good basis, a good principle for a church to come together and to think about, well, what are we doing? Why are we our church? And, and what's God brought us here for? Because we all want to have a job, don't we? We all want to be, have a purpose in, in our lives and especially in our spiritual lives. So what's it mean to be a gospel people? Because it's all right talking words, it's understanding what they mean. You know, it's, it's, uh, we baptize those who repent and trust in Christ, and we've had the pleasure of doing that recently here. Because in baptism, we're called to be disciples who share in the death and in the resurrection of Christ. 
It's a sort of basis, isn't it? Through baptism we received into the church, the body of Christ, immersed into the fellowship of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, so that we might know Christ better. And as we know him, we follow him, and we name him Lord. And as we do that, then of course we obey him. That, that is, that's a given, if you like, but we don't always think about it too deeply. From that it would follow then that in order for us to embrace this tenet, this thing to be a gospel person, we're required to embrace the good news of Jesus, which tells us that there's a salvation to be obtained from Father. None of us can have the excuse of saying we didn't know that, because all of us are invited to become disciples of Jesus, and that entails us repenting of our past sins, throwing ourselves upon the mercy of Christ to forgive us and to take our sins away. We've reflected on that in, in our communion uh, this morning and also in our, in our prayers. We, we recognize that. But of course, it's one thing to recognize it. It's another thing to live it out, you know, isn't it? To say, oh, well, that's me. <laughs> that's not just all these good folk I'm, I mix with and hope that it sort of rubs off on me. No, that's me. I have a responsibility to do this. Because having done all that, we're further required to follow Christ, as I say, through the waters of baptism. To show him and others we really mean what we say. And that's what it means to share in the death and the resurrection of Christ. We've done that. We know we're received into the body of Christ here on earth. And that is the universal church, not just Brixington, you know. It's, uh, we're immersed into the, into the Trinity, but the Trinity is for all time and means the whole of the world. It means we know Christ. We know what he's like. We understand him as a friend and a counselor, as a defender, as a leader. And to know Christ is to follow him wherever he might lead us, wherever he might lead you. And to that end, we also have to accept he's the boss. <laughs> you know, if we say he's Lord, it means that we have to obey him, not ignore him. We must actively seek to hear his instruction. We must be prepared to obey him completely. Even if we feel that inst his instruction is counter to our desires, perhaps especially if we think his instruction to us is counter to our desires. I don't know about you, but I've got, I've got things which I, I rather enjoy doing. They're always good for me. Debbie asked me as I walked in, do you like mince pies? And I said, come on. <laughs> of course I like mince pies. She has a special offer on mince pies this morning. <laughs> but that's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> we like things, we desire them, they're not always good for us. If the Lord says, I want you to go to this particular set of people and tell them the good news, it's no good saying to Jesus, Lord, I, I don't know these people. As you. you don't know these people as I do. <laughs> They won't listen. Now, when you think about that for a second, that's blatantly untrue, isn't it? Of course he knows them better than you do. He's, he's hearing everything all the time. He knows all things. He knows them far better than you and I will ever know them. And if he says, go tell them, he's doing that for a reason. And so we have to be alone to obey even when we don't want to. <laughs> We have to learn to obey even when we don't fancy it. The second thing that Jesus calls us to be is a worshipping community. One of Jesus' commands to his disciples is that they shall love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength. Now, the heart is the emotion. The soul is the spirit. The mind is the logic. And the strength is the physical attribute of the disciple. In other words, there's no parts of your makeup that could or should be withheld from worshipping God. Now think about that for just a moment. When many of us come to worship, we do so with the idea we'll only offer certain bits to God. Oh, you might deny that, but actually the reality is that's what we do. 
when we come to church, I wonder how often you think, well, your first thought might well be, well, I hope Norman's chosen some decent worship songs this morning, <laughs> ones I can sing, you know, ones that aren't sort of designed to be just played on a guitar and one person singing, but for a congregation to sing together to enjoy. I hope that's not how you think, but that sometimes crosses our minds. Our first thought might well be that. We think then, in that way, I would suggest we're withholding the heart of the... We're withholding from God our hearts. We're withholding from God a spirit. And probably the strength from our worship. Because we're, we're approaching it with a critical edge. We're worshipping with our mind... The logic part of our makeup, but the rest of us is on hold. Or else we might switch off when the prayers come round, finding our minds wandering to the dinner in the oven or the latest big project at home. Perhaps we find that our emotions are engaged when we worship, become so lost in our emotions. Have you ever been there? So lost in the emotion of the moment we fail to understand what we're actually singing. <laughs> oh, that tune just strikes me. That just helps me sing, it helps me worship. And so we sing words perhaps we know quite well, but we don't think about what we're singing. See what I'm saying? We're most certainly offering our heart to God. We're fully engaged in the spirit, but the mind has been disengaged somehow. It is so hard to bring it all together. Uh, before all this gets a bit too technical, I want to say it's really useful for us to enter into too much self-analysis, especially when we come to worship. But we do need reminding from time to time that the worship of our God requires us to enter into that worship entirely, enjoying the presence of God, engaging our spirits with His, finding the mind of Christ in our own mind, Allowing God to touch our emotions through the words of songs, through the beauty of the experience, through the very presence of the King of Kings in our midst. Because if we do that, then we're free to use all of our strength to ensure this is not a rare or one-off experience, but something which we can always engage in every time we come into the presence of God. See, I, I find that those words even, they're a bit silly, aren't they? When we come into the presence of God, God's always with you. You brought him with you, didn't you? He was here before you were, but you also brought him with you. And you'll take him home with you. And as you speak with friends and as you speak with the, the bloke that runs the shop or whatever, he's with you still. And guess what? He's even in that shop. You know, we're working and moving in the power and the presence of God all the time. And we cannot divorce ourselves from that. We don't want to. Because that is what it's all about. Being a worshipping person means it's not just when we come together to sing, it's when we live. <laughs> so when you open your eyes in the morning, wow, you're a worshipping person as soon as you get there. Yeah? Yeah? So we're worshipping not just in church, but in our everyday lives. So how many of you give heartfelt thanks for a beautiful day, for the sight of a newborn lamb or a calf, for the beauty of the flowers in the garden, for the wonderful views that we can so often take for granted around here. We enjoy, we're so blessed, aren't we, to live in a beautiful part. I spent a lot of my ministry time in the middle of towns, and I used to walk from church, from home to church in Peterborough. I'm sorry, Peter, if there's anybody watching. But I used to walk through these dingy streets with the waft of curries of various things floating around me, and it was dark and it was cold. I used to think, Lord, couldn't you find somewhere more beautiful for me to worship? It to be? We are so blessed. And we should wake up blessed. I used to have a golfing colleague who was not a Christian, but time after time he'd stop when we reached the third tee at the Ilfracombe Golf Course. 
because it looked out over Watermouth Bay and back towards Hangman and Coombe Martin where we lived. And you know, he'd stop and he'd turn around and he'd say, just look at that. He wasn't a Christian. I could glorify God and say, praise God for that, thank you. He enjoyed what he saw, but so much missed, wasn't there? Because it wasn't, it wasn't the whole of him. And yet I could join in, and I shared so often with him <laughs> what God had done. He sort of paid lip service to it, but he couldn't catch it. But I knew what he meant, because that view is outstanding. And I could give God the praise for making it. We're meant to be worshipping people. And if we fail to do that, our lives are going to be poorer for it. We worship him when we pray to him. Because we engage on so many levels. Our prayers don't always need to be of the worshipping kind. Because just the fact that we acknowledge God in prayer means we're offering ourselves to him. <laughs> My wife sometimes accuses me of ignoring her. I don't mean to. It's just that sometimes I'm caught it up in my own thoughts or, or lost in some interesting problem and I have, if you like, temporarily put her to the back of my mind while I focus on what I'm doing. She's hurt by that. And in no uncertain times, time and again, I've been made to see the error of my ways. As a husband, I'm used to being chastised and I'm quite happy to take it on board because I know my faults better than perhaps even she does. But you see, God is often ignored by us. He too rightly feels hurt and neglected by the way in which we switch off from him. He needs to remind us that as his disciples, we're meant to be in close contact with him always, not just when we're in trouble, not just when we want something from him, but just for the sheer pleasure of chatting with him, of having that easy, natural relationship with him that we can have with our spouses or with our friends. You know, we, we, we often neglect the fact that we can actually just enjoy having a mate. Now, I don't want to lower God's almighty position by saying that. But what I mean is that he wants to be our friend. He wants to relate to us, and he wants to relate to us on every level. And sometimes as you're walking along, you see something beautiful, and I say, oh, thank you, Father. Thanks for that. You've, you've opened my eyes to see something that you've made, and I can appreciate it for what it is. That's not derogatory, that's, that's just appreciating, isn't it? Jesus' instruction to go and make disciples of all nations isn't an instruction for missionaries only, you know. Nor is it an encouragement for us to support missionaries with our finance and our prayers and leave it at that. Being a missionary people means that we're, we all have a part to play in the witness of Christ in the world. You and I are missionaries when we speak to our neighbours about our faith, when we're missionaries when we, we live out our faith in the communities we're sent to. We're missionaries whenever we're called upon to be Christ for our neighbours, whether that be offering words of comfort, carrying out charitable actions on their behalf, or just being friendly. We take the trouble to examine just what missionaries do when they go on our behalf into the mission fields, we'd find that actually they do very little different than what you and I are expected to do in this country, in our communities. They seek to live out their lives as integrated members of the community they're sent to. So are you. They seek to offer their work skills. They seek to share their beliefs with those they work with. So are you. They go to church in order they might stay in touch with the worshipping community and they offer the love of Christ to their neighbours, and so should you. So what's all that amount to? Well, in the start of this new year, it's customary, as I say, to make resolutions. And these resolutions amount to determination to make changes 
in the way in which we live our lives. See, making changes means we cannot live this year in exactly the same way we did last year. I might be stating the obvious in that, but it's amazing how often we decide in our minds to make changes, but in reality, nothing, nothing does change. Because we fail to take the necessary steps to implement those changes in our lives. When we make spiritual decisions, I often find we're full of good intentions, but those intentions remain just that. Intentions. Really because we don't know how to go about making these changes. So, to finish this week, I thought I might make one or two suggestions. Whether you think they're good suggestions or, or rubbish suggestions is up to you, of course. I can't make your minds up for you, but can I urge you to think up some alterations to your lifestyle that just, not just appeals, but you can see could happen and then go for it. Changes of lifestyle involve an understanding that in the past all has not been right with your relationship with God. I think that's a good place to start with all of this. And it's to, it's to start with confession. Admit to God you've realized your relationship with him hasn't been as close, hasn't been as loving as it should have been. Ask for forgiveness. That's the first step of repentance. Ask he might show you through his word how you might improve that relationship. That's going to involve you seeking his face through the reading of his word daily. And that alone will improve your understanding of what God would ask of you. Now, many of you do this, I know. But how often do we allow that to impact and to change us? We read something, and I don't know about you, but I often find I, I read the morning reading or whatever, and think, yes, that's very true. Thank you, Lord, for that reminder. And I forget to see that God is saying, actually, this isn't a reminder, Rod. I know you know this. This is a, this is a charge on you to make a change to make that apply to your life. Ah, that's a bit different, isn't it? Because then I've got to do something. Ask yourself how often you really do make time for God. Is it just a quick five minutes at the start and the end of the day? Do you exist on a diet of arrow prayers? Shot up to God when you remember or when you see trouble looming in your life? Or do you go for days on end without even thinking about him? It can happen. Try to set aside an hour in your week which is devoted to him alone. Maybe... Christian, you know, we, we were given, um, we didn't ask for it, my, my daughter bought us uh, Alexa. <laughs> and we find ourselves talking to this machine now and saying, do this, do that, do that. Quite scary, really, but you know, it's there and it's, it's gradually sort of infiltrating into our lives. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is good, but still. But I just asked her to play some Christian music, and it's been so uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> you got quite a good sort of uh, repertoire of, of good Christian songs and, and music. And so I thought, well, that's quite good. We could do this more often. So there is a sense in which offering to God yourself just for an hour a week and asking him to speak into your life. Just imagine you're visiting, uh, visiting an old friend just for the fun of being in his or her presence. Just for the joy of chatting through your life. Laughing over some silly things that happen to us all. You get the idea? You, you know, so often we do that, don't we? With friends, relations or whatever. We just visit them. No particular reason. We just want to see them. Imagine that with God. We engage with the one who's been with you through all of these turbulent times, whether or not you knew it. And see if that doesn't make a difference to the way in which you view life from there on. If that helps, well, take it for what it is. If it doesn't, throw it away. Well, I have to leave looking at what it means to be sacrificial and inclusive and prophetic community, perhaps for another time, but perhaps... You could research those things for yourself. Bit of homework there, look. But there is a sense in which what, I, what I, I feel God wants to say to us this morning is, look, it's a new year, 
new opportunities, it's time for a change. And it's not a change in the church, it's a change in you. Because you are the church. It's a change in your relationship with me, and it's a change which will do us both good. Because as you get nearer to me, my heart warms. Do you want to warm God's heart this morning? Do you want to help him feel that he's making some progress with you? We have grandchildren and sometimes they come and, and we chat and I think, Lord, we're going backwards here. You know, we're not making a lot of progress here. And it can be a bit disheartening. I wonder if God looks at us like that sometimes and thinks, going backwards with Rod, going backwards, we need to, we need to cheer him up a bit. So let's just give this moment, if you like, to God. Lord, your word challenges us so often. Your word speaks to us so often about the way in which we relate with other people and with you. I just pray this morning, Lord, that as we think about what it means to be your child, what it means to be forgiven, what it means to be given new beginnings. Lord, you will help us to see our personal responses required for that. And help us, Lord, to become people who really do want to please your heart, warm your heart. Because we ask it that Jesus might be glorified in all that we say, all that we do, all that we are. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for caring for us. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing uh, about hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus.
dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Whilst you are still standing, we'll say the grace together and then you might like to sit down whilst I pray afterwards, okay? So the words will be on the screen, hopefully, and we will share the grace to one another. Reach out to each other and you at home, raise your hands if you wish and bless, let's bless each other. We are not restricted by bricks and mortar here this morning, but God's church is around the world and we bless each other as an international worldwide church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Amen.